kids town for Sunday school and everybody over fifth grade goes to Sunday school. Ricky, you got that? Are y'all going to visit Mama this week because it's her birthday? I love it. Y'all are good. Can, you, can y'all help Cheryl get there? She's having a little trouble today. <laughs> I couldn't let it go, Cheryl. I'm on here. I'm on. You got me? Okay. We're, we're live. Live and in living color. Thank you, Brother Mark. What a, what a good song. We stand redeemed. Bought by the blood of the Lamb. And uh, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin and gives us standing with God, proper standing, where we can actually go to heaven when we die because of His shed blood. Isn't that good news? Amen. We've been talking about uh, a lot about marriage and how to build a strong and bulletproof one. But I want to take you a little further today because in order to have a bulletproof marriage, you have to have two bulletproof people. You try to put two people that aren't bulletproof together and then try to establish something and try to make it bulletproof, it's not going to be real successful. So it, it starts with the individual. Whether you're married or not married, uh, it starts with you. And you having an, a bulletproof life. Because some marry, some don't. And uh, the Satan attacks all that call themselves Christians. Amen? Yeah, so we need to take a deeper look today in Ephesians chapter 6. With the suicide uh, rate on the rise across our nation and world, uh, we must explore the Word of God to see if there are ways we can prevent these terrible outcomes. With many people choosing to uh, end their lives, it's quite apparent Lucifer's on the loose. And Lucifer's having a field day with human beings around the world. Uh, across our nation in 2014, there were 42,733 suicides. I'll blow it up so you can see it. 42,000. 773 males, there were 33,113 that took their lives. Females, 9,660. White folks, 38,675. Non-whites, 4,098. Black people, 2,421. Elderly, 65 plus years of age, there were 7,693 that ended their own lives. Young people, 15 to 24, there were 5,079 who didn't think it was worth living, took their own lives. Middle age, 45 to 64, 16,294 suicides. Every 12.3 minutes, a person will take their own life in America. While we're at church this morning, 12 to 13 people will will take their life across our nation. Uh, And some of those that choose to do that are Christians. You say, a Christian can't commit suicide. I've known some Christians who committed suicide. Had a family member that that one of our, that we were married into, that 19-year-old girl that took her life. So it affects not only lost people, it affects saved people. And uh, it's one thing to tragically end a marriage. It's a whole other thing to tragically end a life. The human race is in a battle for survival against a very shrewd and evil entity. And we call him Satan. He hated humans from the day they were created. And he's hell-bent on destroying as many as he can. And if he can convince people to take their own lives, he's won the battle for that particular period of their life. Take your Bibles this morning and let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to read to, begin reading in verse 10. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. In reality, each person, whether they're married or not, is, whether they're married or single, is a target of the enemy. When you take up arms against Satan, which every believer has done, when you believe on Christ, you've actually taken up arms against Satan. Don't think for a moment he's not going to attack you and come back against you. He attacked Jesus, and don't you think that he'll attack you? Because we're so far uh, below where Jesus was. Uh, See, many Christians don't realize we're in a war. Nobody told me that when I believed. When I asked Jesus in my heart, they didn't say, hey, you're you're getting your soldier now, you're in a war. I I learned that later through hard times and things that were coming into my life. And then I found out I was in a war. And that's not a war with bullets and bombs, although sometimes it might turn into that. It's a war nonetheless. Those that think Christianity is a crutch 
they know nothing of the real Christian life, do they? They think Christianity is a crutch. No, it's not. <laughs> because every single time a person takes sides with God, they're taking sides against the enemy. And the enemy hates it. And he will come against us. So God's Word says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Verse 11 says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. See, one or two pieces of the armor is not enough. It says put on all the pieces of the armor. Some people like to pick and choose what parts of the Christian life they want to live and want to be like. That makes about as much sense as a little boy uh, watching a, a tackle football game and he decides he wants to be a part of the game. He grabs a helmet off the sidelines, puts it on and runs into the game. And he runs right into all those people that have their pads and they're ten times as big as he is. All he's doing is getting ready to get killed, isn't he? Now, he might not physically die, but he's getting ready to get hurt pretty bad because he thinks he wants to be a big boy, and he puts the helmet on, yet he's not ready. In the same way, a believer needs to be all the way in or all the way out. Don't just put the helmet on. Don't just take parts of Christian life. Uh, I frequently talk to people in counseling, particularly couples, that they want the benefits of what Christians have in their marriage. They want to have a marriage like that, yet they don't want to commit their life to Christ. And it's hard to explain to them that you can't have one without the other. The byproduct of having Christ in your life is, is having a marriage that will last and be bulletproof. But having a marriage like that without having Christ in your life is, is almost impossible. Although some lost people, their marriages make it and sometimes they last a long time. It's a whole lot smarter and a whole lot easier when Christ is in your life and, and arming you. Uh, you have to be all the way in. It says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategy of the, of the devil. Verse 12 says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, we're not in a game. Some people approach the Christian life like it's like a game. Just play, let's just play this role. Let's play this game. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with some of the games that young people are playing right now, but gaming is a big deal. It's a profession for some people these days. How many of you know what gaming is? Might not know, but it's real big. And people get into to video games and play them online, play them on their iPads, play them on their computers. It's big, 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 big bucks, big, big business. One of the newest programs right now, a new game that's out, is called No Man's Sky. Anybody out there heard of that? Probably hadn't even heard of it. Any young people heard of it? It's the latest one out. You know how much it cost? One game, $85. Just for one game. Now, the game is extensive. And, and what the kids do and the, and the adults that play it, they can explore billions of planets out there on this particular game. And they go into these, into these planets and explore and fight enemies and whatever, whatever's in that planet in this make-believe world. But it's, it's a make-believe world. It's not real. Yet people entangle themselves in it and, and they play it and, they, and they, they are so engrossed in it, it affects all the other areas of their life because they're in this make-believe game world. Folks, the battle we're in is not make-believe. It's the real deal. We're not in a, in a game. We're in a, in a fight. Uh, the war we're in is not a game. It's a spiritual war. And although many times it breaks out into the physical realm, and sometimes human beings are physically attacked by the enemy. Most of the time, it's mental and spiritual in nature. Uh, the majority of this war is fought behind the scenes with these spiritual wicked rulers somewhere in the heavenly places pulling strings. See, we always think we control things, don't we? We think we control the election. People around the world think we, we're the ones that put people in power. In reality, there's a whole uh, scheme behind the scenes we don't even see. Can't feel it, can't, can't even understand it unless you know, have spiritual eyes. And, and here it says we don't fight against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. See, there's things behind the scenes we don't know about. Verse 13 says, Therefore, since these things are true, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. Now, in this passage, the Holy Spirit orders us to make sure we equip ourselves with the right armor. 
in the marriages, we've been talking about armor plating, haven't we? But in the physical life, in your physical Christian walk, there are spiritual things that you need to put on, spiritual weapons, spiritual armor, that will help make you as an individual bulletproof. If we do, we'll be able to resist the enemy when he comes. And if we do, we'll still be standing at the end of the battle when our battle ends one day. And I know many godly warriors that fought that battle that are now in heaven. I know Warren Brewer wore that, wore those, wore that armor his whole life that I knew him. And he stood firm all the way to the end. Dick Hammond wore it all the way to the end. And each one of you that have lost your, your loved ones that were godly Christians that fought that battle their whole life, they ended their life standing firm in their faith. Brother Paul, at the end of his life, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I've, I've fought the fight and I've kept the faith. You know, and he said, Dad, there's a reward waiting on me up there. And I'm getting ready to meet. You see, he held out and he was firm till the end. Brother Bill Brown, he's been, how old are you now, Brother Brown? 87. 87. He said he's going to try to make it to 97. He told me the other day. He said, and he's going to retire. <laughs> but he's been serving God for a long time. My daddy's back there, 83. He's been serving God a long time. They've, they've been fighting this battle. And, and when if the Lord doesn't come tomorrow, the next day, or within the next year, I believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus, but if he should not come until some of us die, guess what? The ones of us that die in our faith are still going to be finishing successfully like others have done. You see, we will be standing, when the, we'll standing firm when the battle is over. Now, as we think about this, we're going to read the, some of the rest of the armor, and we'll come back and look at each piece once we, we look at the Scripture. Verse 14 says, "...stand your ground." putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Verse 15, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Verse 16, in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the devil. And verse 17 says, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of, the, word of God. And verse 18 says and concludes, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Let's begin with prayer this morning as we look at putting on God's armor and building that bulletproof life God wants each Christian to have. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, Lord. And as we delve into your word today, I pray that you'll give us insight, Lord. Help me to get out of the way and that your Holy Spirit will come out and show my brothers and sisters what you would have them learn. Lord, help me to be filled with your spirit and have your anointing as I share the word today. Thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here. And we say a special prayer for Sister Norma today, Lord, as her sister is now with you. And, and she, has to, she and her sisters and family have to go through this grief process. Help them, Lord, in a powerful way. I, I pray that you'll be with Ashley and the family, Lord, as they've lost their home. And you'll provide for every need that they have. Lord, bless us today at baptism. Help the rain to be held off so we can have a good day when these brothers and sisters follow you in baptism. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The writer here in, in Ephesians 6 assumes that a person has already made a decision to follow Christ completely with their life. It's not written to unbelievers. It's actually written to believers. And the, the beginning of this letter addresses certain people. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, we find out who this letter was written to. Brother Paul said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now here, here is who it's written to. To saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This epistle, this letter, is written specifically to believers at Ephesus during that period of time and generally to all believers everywhere for all time you understand that the church at Ephesus no longer exists many of you don't understand that but what was written then to them now is uh, the only thing left in Ephesus which is in modern day Turkey here on the edge of the Mediterranean Turkey is an Islamic country totally ruled by the Muslims and a Muslim tour guide will take you and show you the ruins of the church at Ephesus. Church of Ephesus no longer exists. But the scripture said that it is written to all and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And I would say, would you put your, if you're a Christian and you love the Lord and you're faithful to Him, would you put your finger on your chest? 
So this scripture is written to you and I, those of us that are faithful in Christ Jesus. So it's applicable to our lives today, and, and it addresses the, the warfare that we're in and also the armor that we should try to make each, make each and every one of us make sure that we put on. Now, the armor described in this passage was the state-of-the-art armor back then. It was the Roman legion armor that all of them wore. And, and all of the Jews knew specifically, and all the Gentiles of that era knew specifically when he referred to these pieces of armor, they knew what he was talking about. Because they saw it all the time. Because the Romans ruled the world. And the scripture says here, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. The first piece of, of uh, armor that it told us to put on was the belt of truth. I, I thought maybe, if I, it were me, I think I'd have grabbed the helmet first. How many of you think you'd have put a helmet on first? <laughs> We'd have grabbed the helmet right off the bat. No, uh, no, that's not what it said. It said, verse 14, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. New, New Living Translation, same verse. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. Now, you think about the belt of truth. Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The belt of truth is when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we found out who he is, and we believe what the word says about him, and we believe that he is the only door to heaven. Because in that same passage, he said, nobody comes to the Father but by me. You go to John chapter 10, he says, I'm the door to the sheep. Nobody can get through the, in the sheep hole except through the door. Those that try to go another way are thieves and robbers. So when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe that he's the only way, and we believe in that truth, then we're putting on this belt of truth. We're understanding and believing what the Word of God says. And it also says to strap on the breastplate of righteousness. See, the breastplate protected our, the vital organs of the, of the warrior, particularly the heart and the lungs. Now, we're, we're bow hunters, a lot of us, and Robbie's a bow hunter, and how many other bow hunters we have out there? I know Ralph bow hunts a little bit. Where's the best shot on a deer? If you want to kill him, where do you want to shoot him? Heart. Where's the second best shot? Lungs. Where's the third best shot? Liver. See, and they're all in this area, aren't they? And, and if we're trying to hurt it, to mortally wound a deer, we don't want to hurt him. We want to mortally wound him, no one. We want to take him home and put him in the freezer. We're going to try to get him in the, in the vital organs. So when the warriors would cover up their vital organs, they were covering those things that would, would quickly bleed out if they were wounded. And during that day, they didn't have bullet piercing uh, bullets, I mean, armor piercing bullets. They had arrows and they had uh, spears and javelins and swords, knives. Most of those things wouldn't penetrate the body armor of that, that era. And so they would protect their vital organs. Uh, the breastplate we are to put on protects our seat of emotions. Our, our, when we talk about thinking with our heart, you know, it, we do think with our heart, don't we? It's, a, it's a, actually a thinking organ. We cover that up with the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. When you believe, see, belief takes root in the heart of man, not in the head. You know, I, I said a moment ago, I would probably put the head on first, you know, put the helmet on. No. The scripture says, put the part that covers the heart on first, the, the breastplate of righteousness, because belief blend, begins in the heart. We have to know in our heart of hearts that it's true. And we, when we adopt that belief, we, we cover ourselves with that breastplate of righteousness. You know, I don't know if you've been, done, seen the latest research on that, but Google this. Google does the heart think and, and see what comes up. Your heart is actually a thinking organ. It has a mind of its own. Your brain thinks, but your heart also has the ability to think on its own and even operate apart from the brain, they say. Scientists are finding this out. Now, isn't it interesting God knew that all along? Have you ever heard anybody ever said he's thinking with his heart, not with his head? You ever heard that? You know, it, see, it's, now we're st it's starting, science is starting to find out that's, that's all true. God knew it all along. And it says here, for with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. 
For it is by, for, here's a living translation, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. See, decisions that are made in the heart affect our eternal destiny. The decision we make to believe God and believe in God sets in motion the work that God does in the rest of our body and in our, in our life and in our mind and in our will. It's interesting, this passage of Scripture, you might have read it before, but in Proverbs chapter 4, and I like particularly verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Out of your heart, you know, in other places it says, Out of the heart proceed of things that, you know, that the good things and the bad things come right out of the heart. Mark 7 says, It's not things on the outside that defile you, but things that come out of the human heart. Not out of the human mind, but out of the human heart. So there's a connection between who we are and what we are and what's actually in our seat of emotions, what the Bible calls our heart. Uh, and you've heard that saying, he's thinking with his heart and not his head. Now, Romans chapter 4 says this, For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and it was counted him as righteousness because of his faith. See, the righteousness that we put on in this breastplate of righteousness is righteousness that God gives us. It's not something we work up and it's not when we turn over a new leaf and we, get, we start being a real good boy, a real good girl, and we start living all the laws of the, the Bible and, and we're suddenly perfect and we're better than the next guy over here that we, we live next. No, 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 no. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's like a clothing it's, it's an item, like, just like this coat I would put on and I button it up and it makes me look better. Covers up certain things, you know. Makes me look nice. Well, the breastplate of righteousness, we put on the, the, the good things that Jesus did. It's not what I did, it's what Jesus did. It's the righteousness of God's own Son and we, we put that on. And uh, Second Corinthians says it this way, verses, uh, chapter 5, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Isn't that cool? To know we put on this breastplate of righteousness, we're able to put on righteousness just like a, a coat because Jesus achieved it for us. See, when we wear it, we are considered perfect and complete in God's sight. Just like when Abraham believed God, God looked down and said, He's righteous. Why, did he, why was he righteous? Because he believed. He put on this breastplate of righteousness. He believed in God. And see, we actually began to take on the characteristics of God when we put on this breastplate. They, you don't do what you used to do. Why? People say, well, you, don't do, you don't act like you used to act. Why? What's going on here? Why? And you say, well, Jesus, I've got Jesus in my life now. You see, the, the breastplate of righteousness begins to affect all areas of our life. And pretty soon, we look different and we act different. And sometimes people say, well, you think you're better than other people. No, <laughs> not really. I'm just like I was, but something new has happened to me. Now I have the breastplate of righteousness on and, and it's reflecting the righteousness of God. I'm, yeah, I'm different, but I'm, no, I'm not better than you. And nobody's better than anybody, but he's better than we are. <laughs> we put on his righteousness and sometimes it's, it begins to set us apart from other people. Uh, we begin to live righteous lives ourselves because of what God does in and through us and because we are wearing this breastplate of righteousness. Then it talks about our feet. Our feet still hadn't gotten to the head. I would have put the helmet on first. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you put the helmet on? That don't make, I mean, this thing was all backwards. When I started doing the outline, I started with the head. No, no, no. It start the other, you start the other way. Put on the belt. and thinking, what, what, what's going on here, Holy Spirit? Tell me, tell me what you're trying to say here because we always think with the head, see, We've got, to, we've got to think it out and reason it out and work it out. And then we do it, right? No. You see, it starts on the inside and works its way out. Works its way eventually to our head. <laughs> see, our feet were made for walking this earth. And it, and it says there, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See, our feet are to be carrying this gospel of peace. We're to walk and search for those that are lost. See, there are only two kinds of people in the, on the earth. They're either saved or they're lost. And the job of the believer, the warrior, the Christian, the person that says they're following God is to find those that don't know him and help them, help them find it. It's like, it's like somebody going down a one-way street and, and everybody in the world screaming and yelling at them, giving them the middle finger. Ah, stop, you idiot! Why? And, and nobody wants to stop traffic. The Christian is to be the one that stops traffic. He says, whoa, whoa, wait, everybody stop for a minute. This guy wants to turn around. All right, buddy, you can turn around now. We'll help you get going the right way. 
That's all a Christian is. We carry the gospel of peace, not of we give them a ticket or fuss at them or tell them where they went wrong and why they three reasons why you, you went the wrong way on the wrong way street. No, we carry the gospel of peace. Our feet are shod with the preparation. It says, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. See, the hearts of men who have been won to Christ have never been won by force. Nobody has ever been converted to Christianity at the point of a spear, at the point of a gun, at the point of a, of, a, of a knife. See, the gospel is not to be forced down people's throats. It's a voluntary, voluntary surrender to the king of kings. See, the Catholics tried it all these years. In fact, in, the, in history, many times Christians have had a bad name because they, in the name of Christianity, and in the name of being Christians... They persecuted Indians down, you know, the conquistadors went all over Central and South America murdering the Indians because they wouldn't believe. And, they, and if they did, they would, they would bow to the cross or die. See, it's never been that. Never from the, from the first time the gospel was shared till now, that has never been real Christianity. It's never forced belief. It's always because we want to believe and because God has asked us, do you want me? And we say, yes, Lord. Peter tried it in the, in the garden. You remember what happened to Peter? They came to get Jesus, and what did Peter do? Pulled his sword out. And, he, and the servant ducked, you know, and he's trying to cut his neck off, you know, cut his head off, and he, he ducked, and he cut his ear off, remember? And Jesus picked his ear up, healed him, and said, Peter, put your sword up. He said, that's, not what, that's what, not what this kingdom is about. He said, those that live by the sword die by the sword. You know what? See, this gospel of peace. We don't, we don't preach... Uh, coercion and forced belief. See, love is our calling card. First John says they'll know we're believers by our love, not by our hate. And everywhere the gospel has gone, every country that the gospel has had inroads, things have, good have happened. Slavery has been overturned. The plight of women has been elevated. The plight of children has been elevated. Uh, people have learned how to, to function and, and provide for themselves on their own. Wells have been dug. Food like the children's table and, and other uh, food ministries have started up. Hospitals and doctors have, have gone there ministering freely because we love the Lord Jesus Christ and our calling card is love. And our feet are shed with the, the gospel of peace, not war and not hatred. You see, he says, put on that, that that's what you put on. When Jesus was on the cross, Luke 23 is a prime example, beautiful picture. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. <laughs> Remember? They were killing him. Stripped his clothes off him. They were gambling to see who, who got his clothes and, you know, mocking him, ridiculing him, and killing him. And yet he said, Father, forgive them. Remember Stephen, Acts chapter 7, he said in verse 59, it said, They stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and, say, and here's what he said. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not that sin to their charge, or this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. All through history, the martyrs have never, never retaliated. <laughs> you look at the ones that are being murdered right now by ISIS, you don't see one of them fighting and screaming and yelling and crying. You see them just quietly submitting like a lamb before the slaughter, is what the scripture says. All day long they've slaughtered us, is what Hebrews says, like a lamb before the, the slaughter. And yet we're, we're going to be victorious because we have the gospel of peace. We, our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. Then it, then it says, hold up the shield of faith. Hold up the shield of faith. Uh, verse 16, in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the devil. One of the most feared weapons of that day in that, that warfare were arrows or spears or lances that had fire attached to them because most of your homes were made out of wood and thatch and that sort of thing and and even the forts were made out of wood and if they would shoot arrows with fire it would destroy whatever it hit when it caught on fire and they would they would put oil and, and tar and fire on those arrows and they would launch them into those settlements and burn things to the ground ships people whatever and yet, here it says, put on, hold up the shield of faith that you'll be able to withstand and stop the fiery darts of the devil. And look what 1 John chapter 5 says, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our... What? Through our... What do we, how do we defeat the world, the evil? Through our faith. 
Listen to Hebrews chapter 11. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith, of, of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, all the prophets. By faith these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. How did they do it? They did it by their faith. The whole chapter of, of chapter 11 in Hebrews is the chapter of the roll call of faith. All through there, people use faith. Faith in God. It's their shield of faith. Now, I was studying that, and I remembered seeing, did you ever see the movie The 300? Anybody see that? Yeah. Great movie about the, the battle at Thermopylae's Pass back in, when uh, Cyrus, I believe it was Cyrus, attacked uh, Greece and was going to overthrow Greece. And the 300 Athenian warriors got that one Thermopylae's pass, a little narrow passageway there, and they fought thousands and thousands and thousands of Persians and were able to, for a long time, defend Athens from the Persian assault. And they, back then they used a, a uh, tactic. Uh, and the Romans perfected it later, but it was called the tortoise. And this was a picture of it. All the shields would line up together and it would, they would be able to, anything they would shoot at them, they could get nothing through. They didn't have bulletproof weapons back then, or I mean bullet armor-piercing weapons back then. And it was like a turtle. Turtle just, he was the original motorhome, by the way, a turtle is, you know that. Yeah, he, he just pulls up inside his shell and, you know, unless you have something pretty sharp and, you, you know, you can crush him, he's, he's, he's just like, hey, man, leave me alone. I'm going to take a nap here. Do whatever you want to, but I'm taking a nap. Listen, when we have the shield of faith, that's what it's like. It says, hold up your shield of faith because the enemy shooting fire darts. Your shield of faith deflects them. Later, when the Romans came along, they perfected it. And here's what one writer said. It said, in ancient Roman warfare, the testido or tortoise formation was a formation used commonly by the Roman legions during battles, particularly sieges. Testudo is the Latin word for tortoise. The Greek term for this formation is chelon. And during the Byzantine era, it seemed to have evolved to what the military manuals of that era called a fulcon. Plutarch describes this formation as used by Mark Anthony during his invasion of Parthia in 36 B.C. Here's what he said. He said, Then the shield bearers wheeled around and enclosed the tight, light-armed troops within their ranks, dropped down to one knee, and held their shields out as a defensive barrier. The men behind them held their shields over the heads of the first rank, while the third rank did the same for the second rank. The resulting shape, which is remark was a, a remarkable sight, looks very much like a roof and is surest protection against arrows which would just glance off. The testito and the way in which it is formed they would, they would take the weak people and the people who didn't have the bigger arm, put them in the middle, and all the warriors with the shields would get around them and they would just cover up. And they would lock the shields together. It was so strong, they, could, they couldn't move very fast because they all had to, to move like that in unison. But they would come to a ravine and they would, they would go across that ravine and they would stop. The wagons could go right across the top of the shields because they were all of them tightly holding them up together. And, and only one person didn't carry all the load. The group carried the load. You see, the tortoise, the shield of faith. Think about this in, in, our, in our economy. Imagine the effect the church would have if all of us would hold our shields of faith up and fight the enemy together. You see, it's important that you become a part of a local church. You can fight the enemy by yourself if you want to, but it's going to be a lot harder to deflect what he's throwing at you. But when you're with the group, we can form the tortoise. <laughs> you see, it's a, good, it's a good tactic, isn't it? That we all have our shield of faith and we work together. Uh, we work in harmony. We hold our shields up together. The darts of the enemy can't get through when we're doing that. And the only hope the enemy has is getting us away from our group, isolating us and pulling us out of that group and out from under the shields. You see, it says put on the shield of faith. And uh, when we use our shields of faith, the enemy has a formidable, formidable task to try to get through. Can't get through when the tortoise is working, can he? Why? Because we have the shield of faith. Then it gets to, finally gets to the head. I, I, I'd have started with the head, wouldn't you? And finally he's going to put the helmet on. I, I, I like helmets, man. I'd, I'd, have picked, put it on. I'd like to have a gator helmet. I'd like to have a, a uh, Miami Dolphins helmet. I just like helmets, you know. I'd like to have a jet helmet. Oh, uh, any kind of helmet. I just, how many of y'all like helmets? I'm just a helmet freak, I guess. But it says, take up the helmet of salvation. 
See, salvation is, is believed on in the heart. Then accepted by the head is the real deal. See, we, we, the problem we have in Christianity is we have so many people with the knowledge here but not here. They, they put the helmet on thinking they're a Christian. They really don't have it nailed down on the inside. They don't have the breastplate of righteousness on. They've never made the connection yet. They've, they put this part on, but they, the connection's not made. But see, all these other things are... Now the helmet comes on. Uh, so many people that drop out of the Christian life, the reason they drop out is they put the helmet on without all the other parts in place. They put the helmet on and say, oh, I'm a Christian now. Look at me. I look like a Christian now. I'm wearing a, I've got the helmet. I'm a Christian. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. It's, not it's, never, it's never happened on the inside yet. It has to happen on the inside before it can work its way out, and then you get your head right. See, many of us are secular brains with a Jesus heart. I was raised totally in secular education my whole life. You know what I was taught? Secular humanism. Most of you were. There's only a few of you in here that weren't secularly educated. Those that are coming to a Christian school, they're getting a whole different philosophy than we got. We were taught, raised to be pagans, but really in the public school system, I was. Santa Fe Community College, I was raised to be a pagan. My daddy and mama taught me right, and I was a Christian at heart, but my head hurt all that other junk. And there was a conflict because my, my head and my heart didn't jive. I knew what they were saying in my heart. It was true, but my head didn't quite get it because I was a secular humanist. See, we've got a lot of, a lot of Christians that are like that today, and they don't, they don't get it. The connection is never made because we've got a secular head with a spiritual heart. Here, we ha we, when we put this helmet on, you see it's got to be factual for the heart before the head can grasp it all. It has to be a, something God does in the heart before our brain can really wrap around it. You've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's true and that you totally believe it and you're fully committed to it before it will change your mind. So we won't just change our mind and then do it. No, it has to be something God starts on the inside and works its way out. You remember in the, in the parable of the, the seed, and when, when they spread the seeds out, remember? It said some seed fell on the stony ground, and you know, it said some of, the, some, of the, some of them sprang up, and it, pretty soon the enemy came along, got the seeds, didn't it? Some fell on good ground, produced fruit, but all the other ones, none of them hardly produced. Why? They made this connection, but it never made this connection. See, when we put on this helmet of salvation, uh, you can't have a saved head and a lost heart, or vice versa. It's got to be both. Uh, when you take up the helmet of salvation, the doubts and the disbeliefs that you have have to be gone. You have to be fully convinced that's what you're going to do. You must be fully convinced of the truth of the gospel. Put on helmet, the salvation as your helmet. See, the, the helmet of salvation helps finish the transformation of the believer. We got all the other things in place, and now we're strapped on the helmet. We're ready for battle. <laughs> Everything's in place now. Uh, it's now connected to our heart. When you strap on the helmet, you're getting ready for the real deal, the real battle. And you're entering the territory of the mind. You're adopting a completely different mindset than you used to have. I was looking at this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these heads up helmets they wear in helicopters these days and some of our, our Cobras and Apaches. This is what the pilot wears. That helmet controls everything in the chopper. He's got a little monocle that flops in front of his eye. He can control the guns. He can control everything in that chopper just by looking, nodding, winking, saying certain words through, through his helmet. Why? Because that helmet is connected to the computer that's connected to the boss, wherever the boss is. Could be in an AWAC jet somewhere. Could be in a command post somewhere else. But the boss, whoever they're at, is watching everything he sees in the monocle and from his visor, the people that are running everything see. The bosses are seeing it. The people that control him are telling him what to do and what not to do. And he can turn his head in the, the machine gun, the Gatlin gun. He doesn't have to turn the airplane. He can just look that way and the machine gun is pointing that way. And he can go, shoot. Just by saying it. Just by thought and movement of his eyes and his head because he has the right helmet on. Now, let that sink in. When you put the helmet of salvation on, who are you connecting up to? You see, we begin to take on the very mindset of God when we do that. 
We take the helmet of salvation. You're entering a totally different set of territories here. The territory of the mind. When Philippians says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to describe what the mind of Christ was like. Uh, the helmet of salvation, trans it finishes the transformation of the believer. It's the finishing touch. When you strap on that helmet, you're getting ready for the real battle. You're, you're adopting a different mindset. But see, many of us have minds that are dominated by other things, don't we? Uh, we're f highly focused on the things that we like to do. We like to chase deer. Some of us like to chase turkey. How many of you are turkey hunters? Robbie killed a nice one this week. Robbie, I, I thought about you this morning. Right when I turned on 24, about a mile from Otter Creek, I saw this look like a black plastic garbage bag blown up on the side of the road. I said, somebody left the garbage. And I looked closer, and it was a turkey. He was going. And I thought, oh, Uncle Robbie would like to be here right now. I tried to get my camera up, and as I went by him, he dropped his tail feathers and had a beard about that long. He was humongous. Big and, you know, some of us have turkey. This is turkey season, by the way. Some of us have fish on the brain. You know, we, our mind is dominated by, by fish. Here's a man's brain. You know, there's, I think this ought to be reversed. It says 30% cars and, I mean, 60% cars and 30% women. I think we should switch that. And then 7% uh, food and what we want to do. And then 3% work, you know, that kind of thing. That's, that's how most of our minds operate. Here's a woman's brain. Uh -oh. There's a headache generator right in the middle. <laughs> I've got a headache, or I need shoes, you know, or impulse shopping, uh, anniversaries and birthdays, talk, 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 and more talk. Uh, not to be mean, ladies, I'll just make you laugh a little bit. I'm not prejudiced against women. I love them. My mama was a woman. You're right back there. Got my suit on, mama. I look good. She likes me to wear a suit, so I wear it for her, but... Uh, Women and men have entirely different mindsets, don't we? But see, when we, when we put on the helmet of salvation, something different happens. Our mind begins to get transformed because now, like that one that the choppers wear, that, that's being, they can control it by looking, but they're being controlled from somewhere else too. It's not just them. It's the boss somewhere telling them, hey, don't shoot that, shoot that. <laughs> we don't want to kill that one, you know. The boss is telling them where to fly, what to do, what the mission is. You see, when we put on the helmet of salvation, we got direct contact and direct line to our Heavenly Father. It says we become transformed by the Holy Spirit. You see, it's a direct connection to Christ through the Holy Spirit. Uh, the more we surrender ourselves to God, the more clearly we can think like He does. We begin to think like Christ and act like Christ. The more we allow the Word to change our lives, the more our minds think like His. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I don't know about you. It's harder for me to go back there now. I've started, I've walked with him for a long time now, and it's hard for me to, I try to make my mind think like it used to think. I really do. I try hard sometimes. To, All right, what's going on here? Why can't I think like that? Well, because I've been thinking like this a long time. Once you think like Christ for a long time, it's hard to go back and make your mind think the old way. The old patterns aren't there anymore. And you're, trans you're different. And it, when, if you could go back and think like that, it's just not the same. It won't bring the same excitement. It won't bring the same joy. It won't bring the same happiness because you've been changed. You've been transformed. It's not like you're a robot or anything. It's just that you're different. It's you're different. You, you put on the helmet of salvation. And then it says to uh, pick up the sword of the Spirit. This same passage says, not only the helmet, but pick up the sword. Why? <laughs> because as soon as you put the helmet on, you better be ready for the hit. When we played football, Brother Jerry Milton was a great football player, and my dad and, all, and those of you that might have played tackle, uh, after the first hit, the jitters were gone, weren't they, Brother Jerry? It was always real nervous before the, before the first hit or two. And I mean, you get, you're getting pumped up. Yeah, yeah, well, poof. Mm, ready for ready for something, you know, and you're nervous. But after that first hit, boom, you get hit a few times. It's all business then. It's all you, game's on. <laughs> you know, you know the fight is there. 
Okay, the, the word says as soon as you put the helmet on, you better pick up, pick up the sword because the battle's coming. Why? Because Satan hates to be disrespected. When you choose to follow Christ and you follow him with your life, you're telling Satan, take a hike. I, I refuse to follow you any longer. You're not going to be my master. You're going to burn in hell like the Bible says one day. And I'm following Jesus. You know what? He won't take that. He won't take that sitting down. He attacked Jesus and tempted him. Don't you think he'll attack you? Oh, you know it. Those people that say the Christian life is, is, is a crutch, they are so full of it. They don't know what they're talking about. The Christian life is a battle. It's a hard, disciplined effort. And we have to do certain things to even remain standing at the end if we do what he said here. And Satan challenged Jesus. He's certainly going to challenge you. It says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, the Word of God says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to cut through stuff. In fact, the sword is what you can do to deliver other people. When you use the Word of God, you can use it effectively to deliver other people that are captured by the enemy. You can cut them loose and release them because you have some, a fierce weapon called the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God cuts through any and everything we face in battle. And then it says in verse 18, Pray in the Spirit at all, at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Pray always, pray in the Spirit. See, the, the same one that says, pick up, the, put all this stuff on, says, you better be a person of prayer. You better be talking to the Master. <laughs> but strap your helmet on, but, but start praying. Why? Because the battle's coming to you soon. And you need the Lord Jesus Christ to help you through that. Uh, one of the greatest weapons we have is prayer. We have no, no other connection to heaven more powerful than that. It's a direct line to heaven. It's never, it's never cut. It's ne there's never a cut in the line to heaven. It's always available. You don't have to pay extra for, for text or messaging <laughs> or voice, voice data. Some of your phones, you're getting, you're getting ripped off by those phone companies, aren't you? But, they, but there's a lot of them have good deals where you can get unlimited text, unlimited data, unlimited voice. Listen, prayer is that. It's unlimited every way connection to the Lord. If you've, how many of you have not seen War Room yet? Anybody not seen it? Please see it. Please see it. It's, it's, a, it's a, exactly what we're talking about, the power of prayer. Uh, yet many of us take prayer lightly. We try everything in the world to do stuff, and then we say, well, let's pray about it. <laughs> well, we should have prayed about it before, shouldn't we? Yeah, we should start with prayer. It says pray always, pray about everything. Uh, God's Word tells us to pray, pray in the Spirit, pray about everything, pray out loud, pray for believers, pray for all believers everywhere, pray for yourself, pray for the battle, because <laughs> it's coming. When you talk about praying in the Spirit, you don't have to, to kneel down and, and close your eyes to pray. You can be riding and have your eyes open, riding down the highway praying. Pray all the time. Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Stay alert, it says. Keep, keep the line open. It's not mine. I don't think whose that is. Mine is a duck quack, so I knew it wasn't. And when Granddaddy calls, it's Tarzan. So I knew it wasn't. When Miss Vonnie calls my wife, it's, it's the girl from Ipanema. And when Mama calls, it's the uh, chicken dance. And then when Granny on the other side calls, it's Granny's on the phone, Granny. So I know who's calling by the sound. So that wasn't mine. Who's ever, that was old-timey ringer. So you need to get a ringtone, whoever that was. That's, you come up with a new, the, the smart age. Get you some ringtones. That's like 50s there, whoever that was. So. Not being mean. I'm just laughing with you. I love, I love you guys. And God loves you very much. He wants you, to, he wants you to have a bulletproof life, but the only way you're going to have it is by bulletproofing your life. So you can't have a, a bulletproof relationship if you're not bulletproof yourself. You get two weak people in a relationship, and what's going to happen? <laughs> It'll be a mess. So many times that when people, when I'm counseling them, and they're not, they're not saved and not going to get saved, but they want the same benefits that God promises those that are saved. can't happen. You see, you've got to be bulletproof. You've got, you got to get signed up with him, okay? And uh, he, he, wants to, to, he wants to sign each and every one of you up. Number one, he wants to keep you out of hell when you die. 
He wants you to, to be a part of the family of God, make you one of his own children, keep you out of hell, but also you get into the inheritance. Ooh, think about that. How many of you think you might have some inheritance coming here on the earth? Any of y'all got some inheritance coming? Nobody will raise their hand, don't want us to know, because we'll be bugging them. <laughs> hey, we've got an inheritance coming, because everything that belonged to Jesus, his kids are going to get. So not only do you get heaven, you get the inheritance. And I like the sound of that. Woo. Ever watch that show, Strange Inheritances? It's a new show on TV. It's really interesting. But ours is not going to be strange. It's going to be good. So you might want to get in on it. Christian life's not a drag. It's a battle. And it's a fun battle. I've always liked a good fight. I don't know if you have. But I enjoy it. And I know this. If I keep my armor on at the end of my fight, I'm going to be standing firm. I might be beat up looking. might be scratched up a little bit from all the, the hits and knocks, but I'm going to be standing firm just like Warren was and just like all my grandparents were. And those of your loved ones, Jack Smith and Ricky and Emma here today, Jack, Jack was a godly man, one of our former deacons and was my Sunday school teacher when I was a teenager. And uh, I, never, I never saw him back up on his faith, did you, Ricky? Not one time. You know, and he, and he carried his faith all the way to the grave and he'll beat us on the other side. I can't wait to see what kind of shield he's got when we get there. Because David's mighty men, the ones that he had, it had shields hanging on the walls and their swords. And I think all of our guys are going to have the same thing. Because although we, we war with invisible weapons, their weapons done the same. And I can't wait to see what they look like. But if you're going to have a bulletproof life, you've got to start now. And you've got to do what the Word of God said. You've got to add the armor to your life. Armor up. If you do, you can make your life bulletproof. Amen? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the word. Lord, help us to do what it says. Help us to armor up, Lord. Put all the pieces of armor in place so we can have bulletproof lives. Lord, if there's someone here today that feels like their life has fallen apart, Lord, draw them to yourself today, Lord. Give them the, the, the entry level. Show them how to f come into your family, Lord. We'll show them how in just a moment's time, Lord. But draw them to yourself. Help them to come as we sing this invitation. <clears throat> Maybe there's someone here today, Lord, that's already in the battle, but they've they just been beat up and they... They've been beat down, Lord. Help them to be lifted up. Be encouraged today, knowing that battle's not over. It's just, just beginning again. And all they got to do is put all the armor on. It'll be all right. You're going to take them safely through. Put the helmet on, Lord, and you'll tell them what to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Savior, like a shepherd, lead.